All right. Thank you for joining me on the third of uh, our videos. Uh, we've already covered the overview of the Canary system. Uh, we have discussed the first step of the three steps, the first step being collecting and storing data. And now we're getting ready to start talking about the second step. How do we add contextualization to the data that is found inside of the Canary Historian? As you recall, the Canary system is a series of seven pre-integrated applications that we have built over the last 35 years to make sure that you um, have the three best-in-class um, characteristics in a historian, and that is openness, security, and adaptability. So let's get started, and we will focus now on our Canary Views. What is Views? Well, Views is the single endpoint for all data access uh, within the Canary Historian. So if I uh, want to do a trend, I'm going to need to connect to Views to access the data inside of the Historian. If I want to create some new calculated tags or do some event monitoring, I'm going to connect through Views to reach the data inside of the Historian. And if I want to publish data out to an MQTT broker or maybe create a JSON over WebSocket stream, you've guessed it, I'm going to need to come through the Views uh, in order to access the data inside of the Historian. So let's dive in deep and let's talk more about the Views service. Because it is that single endpoint for not just Canary services, but also any third uh, party application, that means that uh, Views acts as our gatekeeper. So it's a great uh, way for us to provide authentication and authorization of any querying clients. Uh, you might have heard on the last video when I mentioned that you can cluster multiple Canary historians. So the historian server is good for more than 2 million tags, but what if you have 4 million tags? You might want to stand two historians side by side uh, in the data center. By pulling views uh, onto its own client server, uh, application server, I can essentially connect to two or three or four or five or more multiple Canary historians and create a cluster of those historians so that when I'm making a query as a client, I don't see multiple historians, but I just see one large uh, archive. Additionally, um, Views allows me to add context to the archive. So that means that I can alias tags, I can create new structure for my tags, I can build parent-child asset models, um, all within Views. So let's talk a little bit more about the asset models. Um, not only do I create virtual abstractions of the tags in the way that they show in the historian, but because they're virtual, I'm not replicating the data. So this could be as simple as aliasing tag names. I might um, have tags that I'm logging from a SCADA system, and so I'm naturally going to get those tags into the archive, into the historian, and they're going to have the same tag names as my SCADA system which could be great for a local site operation, but it could be very problematic if I'm trying to create a corporate naming standard and I have sites that don't match that standard. Don't worry. I don't have to change the way those tags are being logged to the historian. Instead, I can use views and create rules that alias those tags so that I can interact with the data according to my corporate standard but I don't have to stop operations at the site level to change tag names or go in and make complicated uh, revisions on a logging document, um, which could be quite costly in time. Instead, I can do it post archive. Additionally, these asset models have depth or structure. So if I wanna create a full asset model and understand um, assets and how they relate to one another, I can do that. I can build complete parent-child relationships there's no limit to the number of levels of child. So I could have deep models that are seven, eight, nine, 10 plus layers deep in their associations. And most importantly in all of this, I can place a single tag in my archive into multiple or into several versions of these models. So I could have a model that speaks um, particularly to my business unit so it might be focused more on production 
and and I could have tags that live in that model, as well as a different asset model that is not production oriented, but maybe it's more maintenance oriented or more um, engineer oriented by engineer that's responsible for these pieces of equipment. That flexibility allows me to create multiple models without, again, replicating the data and provide really the best version of that data to each of my user groups based on the job they're trying to accomplish. Asset models are built by the administrators. The client never sees any of this. They only just see the data the way that it is best for them to have it shown to them. So how is this open? How is this secure? How is this adaptable? Well, it's open because we make sure that third-party applications, non-Canary products, have the ability to connect to views just like Canary applications. And they can do this through our APIs. They can do this through standard protocols um, that we support. And we'll talk more about that in, step, uh, in the next video when we talk about the data feeds. Um, TLS for the security side. Uh, again, anytime we're moving data, so from archive to client, we're using TLS. That means it's encrypted in transit. You'll remember it was encrypted in transit when we were logging it. It was encrypted at rest inside of the archive. And now again, it's encrypted in transit. That means authentication, authorization, full encryption. And how's it adaptable? Well, views can connect to multiple historians. Views can show multiple data pictures, if you will. So complete adaptability uh, on our view service. But what about calcs and events? That's the other piece of contextualization. I've got tags that are being logged um, coming into the historian. How can I add more context around those tags? For instance, I might have three pumps. Each pump might have a flow. How do I add context on what is my average flow for those three pumps? That's where our calcs and events server comes in. So some of the features of the calcs and events server um, through the views, and through the models that you build in views, the server is able to read all of the data inside of the historian so that you can create custom calculated tags, also so you can create custom event tables. You have two different capabilities with that new tag, that calculated tag. So you can output that tag in real time, so essentially on change. Or you can say, run a calculation every five minutes or every hour, every shift, every week, every month. Um, you are able to configure that completely inside of the calc server. Your calcs can have dependencies. So I could create multiple tiers of calculations that build off of each other. So once I've created my first calculated tag, it might live in another calculation as part of a second calculated tag. Well, we automatically manage those dependencies. So if something happens upstream, your downstream calculations are aware of that. This is a really neat feature, the backfilling of calculations. So uh, imagine you're in your sandbox, you're, you're working with the calc server, you're trying to create um, the perfect expression that is going to give you this new piece of information. Well, how do you validate that? Do you build it and then go run it and then wait a week and come back and check the results? Well, that wouldn't be efficient. So instead, we've given you the ability um, to backfill calculations. So you can work on your expressions. You can backfill that calculation, immediately look at the data, validate the results. And if you're happy with it, go ahead and deploy that calculation out everywhere. Or if you're not happy with it, you can overwrite, make changes, and overwrite the values that you have just backfilled with new values. Again, working through this process um, of trying to create and validate your expressions. All right, now, as you're building all of these different calculations, um, at some point, you're gonna build a calculation that serves as a bit of a notification or a, a, an alarm or, or just a Boolean that's true or false. And it's gonna represent an event frame for you. It's going to represent uh, something has started. Well, we can monitor that process and create a separate SQL table of events. So you can define the start and you can define the, the stop. And in between is the duration of your event. And that, that event gets linked to the asset that it belongs to. 
uh, and we give you the ability uh, inside of that duration of that event to actually create custom analytics and create new analytic tags or properties around the event itself. So let's talk about some of the examples of these calculations. Um, something as simple as a single tag transformation. First example that comes to mind, it's in Celsius, I wanna convert it to Fahrenheit. Uh, or how about a multiple tag expression? Um, three pumps, three flows, let's output an average flow tag. Uh, we can do quality evaluations. So if data quality is good, take this action, if bad, take this action. Uh, in the last hour, what percentage of my data quality was good or what percentage was bad? State awareness. Um, easy enough. Uh, create an expression that tells me whether my line is running or not. Conditional statements. So um, if line is running and data quality is greater than 96%, then output true. If not, output false. Statistical calculations. So we support all of the OPC foundation aggregates. So that means that you can run mins, maxes, standard deviations, variance of population, all, all of your standard statistical calculations. I can create calculated tags that help me understand time since or time remaining. So what has been the time since shift start? What is the time remaining for end of week? Great for production forecasting, um, as well as time since batch start, time over estimated batch completion, for instance. Uh, value projections, again, we've made 147,000 widgets. We've done that in the last six and a half hours. Based on our last 30 minutes of operation, at the end of our eight hour shift, we should be to X number of widgets. We have a series of asset calculations. So with the asset model, we get a sense of asset type. How many pumps do I have? Uh, in, this, in this section of my operation, what is my pump, pump count? Okay, now that I understand my pump count, what is my average of all of my pumps? What is my, meaning I pick a, uh, pick a tag associated with a pump. What's been the average value of that tag across the number of pumps? What's been the total? So totalizers based on asset rollups. Um, what's the min? What's the max? Um, all asset-based calculations. Uh, and then finally, uh, the idea of time interval aggregations. So um, I have a flow on my pump. I'd like to know not what the flow is right now, but what is the 60-minute running average of that flow? and update that every 30 seconds. So let's talk about how we make sure that calcs and events are open, how they're secure, and how they're adaptable. Calcs are built on standard libraries, things like NCALC and OPC functions. Any events that get written are getting written to an open SQL uh, database. So by default, we write to SQLite. It's, a, it's packaged and included in our system. But if you have another SQL database you'd like us to write to, that can be configured. How is it secure? Well, again, only admins have access to this server. So uh, it's, not a, it's not a tool that's made available to Canary clients or that someone in the client role or the data consumer role. You have to be an admin. You have to have admin rights to the server. You have to have admin rights to the Canary um, central admin application. And as we're writing calculations, we're using TLS again to push that data back into the historian. How's it adaptable? This is my favorite part. When I write an expression and tie it to an asset, let's use the pump example, I might have 150 pumps in my organization. I can write one expression, flow, 60 minute running time average, calculated every five minutes. Inside of that same expression, I can nest the second calculation. If 60 minute running flow is greater than X, trigger an alarm. You know, show me a one. If it's less, zero. 
I can now validate those expressions and then deploy it to all 150 of my pumps. If new pumps come into my system and are built into the model, the calculation will automatically be applied to those new pumps. I don't have anything I have to do from an administrative standpoint to make that happen. Completely adaptable. All right, that's gonna conclude us in step two, uh, adding context. That means the last piece of understanding how we make it easy to use the Canary system without cutting any corners uh, is all about maximizing the value of your solution using Axiom and using our data feeds to get the information that you have built inside of Canary out to your people and to your systems. I look forward to seeing you on that video.